Welcome to episode 93 of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. I'm a retired agent writing crime fiction inspired by true crime FBI cases. Today, we get to speak to retired agent Dr. Joseph Decino, DDS, who served in the FBI for 22 years. Prior to joining the FBI, Dr. Decino, who received a doctorate of dental surgery degree from the Ohio State University in Columbus, Ohio, owned and operated a family dental practice. He was initially assigned to the Washington field office where he investigated reactive crimes. After three years in the field, Dr. Dezino was promoted and transferred to the FBI laboratory where he began to specialize in the examination of hairs and fibers. Dr. Dezino served as a critical investigative resource on many high-profile cases, including dental and DNA identification at the Branch Davidian Colt Fire, kidnappings, and major extortion cases. In this episode, Dr. Dezino reviews the functions of the FBI laboratory and the investigation of the tragic murders of Joanne Katrinak and her baby Alex, where mitochondrial DNA analysis was first applied to forensic casework. Dr. Dezino was part of the research team that developed and validated forensic mitochondrial DNA analysis capability, which enabled the FBI to obtain DNA profile from evidence containing small or degraded quantities of DNA from hair, bone, teeth, and bodily fluids. Dr. Dezino ended his bureau career as the director of the FBI laboratory, where he led more than 550 FBI laboratory personnel, providing forensic examinations, technical support, expert witness testimony, and training to federal, state, and local law enforcement agencies, as well as responding to events and natural disasters all around the world. Currently, Dr. Dezino is a faculty member at George Mason University in Fairfax, Virginia, where he teaches forensic science to undergraduate and graduate level students in the forensic science program. For those of you who have been listening to this podcast for a while, you know that we have heard about agents who did many different things before they became an FBI agent, but A dentist? That's a pre-FBI career that I'm sure you were surprised to hear about. This is such an informative interview. I learned so much that I felt like I had been to class, a class that I thoroughly enjoyed attending. Before we get to the interview, for those of you who are listening to this on the day that this episode is released, I want to say happy Thanksgiving. This has just been a fantastic year for me personally with the marriage of my daughter and my 12 day trip to Spain and professionally with the continued success of this podcast and of my FBI crime thriller pay to play. I truly, truly want to thank you for your support. And I truly wish for you the same happiness and success that I've experienced this year. I want to remind you about that special giveaway that I'm running this month. And all you need to do to enter that giveaway is to be a member of my reader team. If you're not yet a member of my reader team, you can join by going to my website, jerrywilliams.com and sign up when you see the pop up or my Facebook page, Jerry Williams Author, and signing up to be a member of my reader team there. What I'm giving away is a special limited edition FBI collectible ornament that you can't get anywhere else except for the FBI Recreation Association store down in Washington, D.C., and from me. So three lucky winners will be selected on December the 1st. After you've signed up to be a member of my reader team, 
I will send you my November reader team email about the FBI and books, TV and movies. And that will explain everything you need to know in order to enter to win that limited edition FBI ornament. This month's email is all about the FBI experience, which is the new FBI tour at FBI headquarters. You'll learn about what you need to do in order to visit the FBI experience and that FBI Recreation Association store. I also want to ask for your help. We are only seven episodes away from our 100th show. And once again, we're going to look at cliches and misconceptions about the FBI and books, TV and movies. We did that on the 50th show and it was such a hit. We're going to do it again for the 100th. So we did 10 for the 50th episode. We'll do 10 more for the 100th episode. I've started collecting some. If you have some things that you've seen on different shows or in different books about the FBI, and you really question about whether or not they're accurate, please let me know. Email me at jerrywilliamsauthor at gmail.com. Tweet me at jerrywilliams1 or message me on my author Facebook page, Jerry Williams Author. I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Now here's the show. I am excited to introduce my guest, Joseph DeZeno. Hi, Joe. How are you? Good, Jerry. How are you? I'm great. Now, I had heard that there was an FBI agent who had been a dentist before his appointment. And I thought that was just an urban legend. But that's you. Yes, that is me. While I was in the Bureau, there were actually three dentists. I believe I I was the first, but there were two that came in after me. So um, there were several of us that practiced dentistry before we came to the Bureau as agents. Well, how impressive, how exciting. So we're here today to talk about what you did with your dentist school knowledge in order to help the FBI. And that was working in the FBI laboratory. That's correct, yes. So how long were you in the lab? And I know at one point you became the head of the lab. Yeah, so I I started in the Bureau in uh, 1986 and uh, was a field agent at the Washington Field Office for approximately three years, uh, where I worked at that time what they called the reactive work, so bank robberies, kidnappings, and extortions. Even during that time, my dental expertise did come in handy on occasion uh, where I was called into cases to um, in the help the identification process um, in deceased individuals uh, through the examination of dental records. After three years in the field, the Bureau reassigned me to the laboratory in uh, about 1989, and I spent uh, about 19 years in the laboratory Uh, in various positions before I retired as the lab director in 2008. And was that the goal or the plan from the very beginning when you came in as an agent to get some field training so you have an understanding of what the FBI does and then for you to go to the lab? So not really. Um, I always was interested in forensics, uh, but I really wanted to be an FBI agent, even... uh, before I went to dental school, I had that in mind, um, but practiced dentistry for a few years and decided, you know, at that time I was I was young enough to be able to make that decision and maybe if the FBI didn't work out, I could always go back to my dental practice in Ohio. I, I had my license and retained my license. So I really, the intention was to go into the FBI to be an agent. When I learned about forensics, more about forensics and new agents training, it became more and more interesting to me, and that sort of led to my career in the laboratory. So it was, a, I guess you would say it was a work in progress while I, uh, when I started with the Bureau. Well, cool. So we're actually going to review a case that you worked on. So we've had a chance on FBI Retired Case File Review to hear from many agents talking about forensics. Dan Riley. Do you know Dan Riley? He was I down do know in Dan Riley. Yeah. So so Dan was on episode seventy seven and he really shared with us how he used forensic and DNA analysis in a drug murder case that he was working where the witnesses were being threatened um with uh, retaliation and, and, and actually were being 
uh, murdered themselves. And so he spent a lot of his time developing forensic evidence. And then we also spoke with Kevin Miles, and he was in episode 86. Do you know Kevin Miles? I do know Kevin. Okay, great. And Kevin talked about, you know, he was a master bomb tech about going out to different sites and gathering evidence to be sent back to the lab for analysis. So it's really great to come back full circle and and hear what happens when that evidence comes to the lab. So could you just give us a kind of a broad overview of the FBI lab, where it is, and the different types of things that we do, and then we'll drill down into, you know, your career in the lab and, and, and the different things that you worked on. Sure. So the, the FBI laboratory, and, and many people think there's more than one laboratory, but there is only one FBI laboratory. It's uh, located in uh, Quantico, Virginia, and it's uh, on the uh, FBI uh, site where we train new agents. Uh, a separate building apart from the, the academy where we train new agents. The main purpose of the FBI laboratory is to examine uh, evidence that's submitted to the laboratory for uh, exa- uh, forensic examination. Uh, once the examinations are complete, reports are written and uh, returned to the law enforcement agencies who submitted the evidence. And many times then the uh, examiners will testify about their analysis and, and the evidence in the case. Cases submitted to the laboratory, obviously FBI evidence from FBI cases is submitted to the laboratory from all over the country, sometimes all over the world, depending on the situation. So the agents in the field, if they need a forensic examination, will submit evidence to the FBI laboratory for analysis. But also the uh, laboratory will perform a forensic analysis uh, submitted to the laboratory by any duly authorized law enforcement agency in the United States that requests an examination of evidence for one of their cases. Uh, the laboratory will perform that examination at no charge to that uh, state, local, or other federal agency, um, and also will testify with no charge to that agency. So a fair amount of cases that are analyzed in the FBI laboratory are, are not simply from FBI cases, but are submitted from state, local, or other federal agencies. Uh, so the, the main thrust of the laboratory is that forensic analysis However, there are other, um, several other missions of the laboratory. One is operational response, where if uh, something either, uh, if there's an event coming up, uh, a big a national event, let's say a Super Bowl, uh, we may, we, the laboratory may deploy agents there just in the event that something happens where our expertise is needed in the field. Um, so that would be uh, operational response before something would happen and maybe to try to prevent something from happening. But certainly uh, the laboratory provides operational response after something happens, whether it be a bombing or a, sometimes even a natural disaster where expertise from the laboratory is needed in the field. And it could be here in the United States. It can be throughout the world. Uh, for the examiners or other personnel from the laboratory to travel and to assist in the investigation uh, in the field. Another mission of the laboratory would be training. Uh, they provide uh, a fair amount of training to uh, whether it be crime scene responders or uh, bomb technicians or uh, forensic um, folks in the in state and local laboratories where they can uh, help to uh, train uh, other examiners at the state and local other federal level in in their expertise in addition to the 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 working the casework that's analyzed in the laboratory the evidence that's analyzed in the laboratory there are uh, other aspects of the laboratory other 
uh, resources that are used in the laboratory to provide response, training, et cetera. So are all the examiners special agents? No, not at all. So when I reported to the laboratory in 1989, all the the examiners were uh, FBI agents, and that changed during my course in the laboratory and to the point where today uh, of the num- the, there are very, very few a- a- FBI agents in the laboratory. Most of the personnel in the ab- uh, laboratory are non-agent personnel, uh, many of them with master's, Ph.D. level science degrees. Uh, the agents in the laboratory today uh, are really there in uh, units where uh, operational response units where uh, you know, their, not only their scientific expertise, uh, is needed, but also they have the agents training and, uh, can, uh, react in an operational response setting, uh, based upon their training, um, better as an agent than, than non-agent. So depending on the situation, uh, operational response, um, many times agents would be sent, uh, for safety and other reasons. All right. I think one of the examples that might, and you might be able to find a, a better one, but I'm thinking about the tsunami that I understood that we had many people from the FBI lab and from the FBI go out to um, uh, identify uh, the remains of the people that had been killed in that. Yes. Yeah, so that happens uh, actually all the time. Uh, the FBI will assist um, state, local, federal, or international uh, law enforcement agencies upon request in working with the State Department, if it's international, uh, to assist in the identification of disaster victims, whether that disaster be an airline crash or a tsunami or any other uh, accidental or natural cause. The FBI has a team of fingerprint examiners who will assist in identification of deceased individuals based on their fingerprints. So uh, the, much of the response uh, in a disaster site type situation by the laboratory will focus on fingerprint examiners who will help in that identification process. Also, at times, uh, depending on the nature of the incident, DNA examiners will be sent uh, to, again, help in collecting and preserving DNA uh, from the victims who uh, may not be identified. Also, possibly collecting DNA from known individuals or known sources so that the unknown DNA can be compared to a known source in an attempt to identify an individual. So, much of the focus of those people who uh, will be deployed to respond to disaster incidents is really a humanitarian uh, mission and an an effort to identify the deceased. Well, that's pretty interesting because I think that most people may not be aware of that. You know, they're thinking that the FBI laboratory is there for the purpose of analyzing evidence for crimes. And this is, when you're talking about humanitarian reasons and not natural disasters, um, the FBI is there for a totally uh, different reason. That's correct. Uh, so certainly the large focus of the laboratory is, is, is on criminal cases, but uh, when the need arises, uh, we are a resource that can be used by the federal government to assist in identification of individuals in a, any sort of disaster incident. And do those individuals need to be U.S. citizens? Uh, So uh, we generally are called into cases where U.S. citizens are involved. However, uh, as you can imagine from any natural disasters, uh, once the, the people are deployed, the victims, if it's an airline crash or a tsunami, there may be some American victims, there may be many American victims, but certainly many of the people that might be victims of any sort of disaster 
may or may not be American, and certainly the FBI uh, personnel deployed would assist in identifying uh, individuals, uh, again, working with the State Department from any country if they were there identifying uh, individuals, they they would not discriminate to to identify just Americans. They would uh, you know, use their expertise to try to identify any and all victims that were presented to them for analysis. Well, I would imagine that on the times that you were deployed for you know such uh, identifications at natural disasters, that that work has got to be very difficult. First of all, the infrastructure of the country has been destroyed during the natural natural disaster. So as far as where you're living, where you're staying, what you're eating, it is already going to be compromised. And then, of course, the work that you're doing, although uh, important work, that difficulty in having to examine bodies that have, uh, you know, are are decomposing, you know, that are um, arm, a leg, I I just can't imagine how you prepare yourself mentally for that type of work. So I think most of the people that do that work uh, really uh, look at it as as a means to do something positive for the victim and for the victim's family. Uh, to identify the victim, get them back home, and 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 um, so that the, the appropriate goodbyes can be said and and arrangements can be made, and to try to put uh, you know put some sort of closure to this you know a terrible tragic incident. So I think most of the people that do that would look would tell you that they they look at it through the eyes of doing something good for the family and victims and that would motivate them to, to keep going back day in and day out. And you're right, in many times very trying, trying uh, circumstances and environments. What uh, situations have you been deployed in? So a couple of the more interesting one, uh, occasions, I was in Waco, Texas uh, for a couple of weeks uh, at the medical examiner's office during the uh, Branch Davidian siege, uh, assisting with not only dental, but DNA identifications in that incident, and a few airline crashes uh, where uh, victim identification was needed, either uh, assistance was needed either through dental or DNA um, expertise on on site. What is the main difference between collecting evidence in a criminal case and doing the type of uh, identification in in a uh, humanitarian analysis. What's the main difference as as far as being out in the field and then taking that information back to the laboratory to analyze it? So really, I I don't think there's, in in the analysis, there in the collection and preservation of the evidence, there's maybe very few differences because you're you're treating, you're, you're trained to collect, preserve evidence in a, in a certain manner. And certainly the analysis, whether it be a criminal case or a, uh, a disaster response, uh, the, the analysis performed by the forensic examiner, whether it be fingerprint-based or DNA-based, uh, would be the same. Uh, so uh, there may be some subtle differences in collection and preservation of evidence, but really very, very few. The, the examiners have the same goal in mind, whether it be, you know, one victim found in the woods, possibly a victim of a crime, uh, collection and preservation there of that victim uh, really doesn't vary much from the collection and preservation of many victims at a natural, uh, at natural disaster. Before we get back to the lab and talk about the work that's done there, I, I think it might be good to talk about uh, chain of custody and the collection, uh, what is expected before that uh, evidence is transferred to the laboratory? So when evidence is found at a crime scene, uh, something called chain of custody has to be maintained from the time it's found at the scene uh, through the time where it may be presented in court as evidence. And, And that's 
to ensure that law enforcement has care and custody of that evidence so that, and the reason behind that is uh, to, to ensure that the evidence is not tampered with and is collected and preserved properly so that the analysis from, the, from that evidence can be trusted and relied upon in court. So the chain of custody from the time it's collected in the field has to be maintained uh, all the way from collection and preservation and submission from, you know, the first it may go to a local law enforcement agency, then it may come to a laboratory. Within the laboratory, uh, one single piece of evidence may have several different exams that may be performed on that one piece of evidence. And as that piece of evidence is transferred throughout the laboratory, that chain of custody also has to be maintained within the chain of custody to, to make sure that we know who had con uh, control and custody of that evidence throughout its journey through the laboratory. And then once the evidence is, is the evidentiary examinations are complete in the laboratory, then chain of custody is then returned to the agency submitting it. Uh, they generally will hold on to it until it then may be presented in trial. So it, uh, without that proper chain of custody, um, if that is broken in any manner, uh, you could make, do the, the, the finest exams possible on that evidence, but if the chain of custody is broken, it may not be admissible in court. So it's very important that that chain of custody of the exam to, to ensure that that evidence is not tampered with in any manner is maintained is, is really critical to the entire uh, the investigation and certainly to the analysis of the evidence. We're going to have the opportunity to talk to you about a case. Uh, so we can take it from the moment you got the evidence all the way to the moment that you testified, and then we'll talk about the resolution of that case. But before we do that, could you just give us uh, an understanding of the different types of laboratory examinations that you worked on during your 19-year career in the laboratory? Sure. So uh, when I first came to the laboratory, uh, I was initially trained in, in trace evidence examinations, hair and fiber examinations. Um, and And the reason that hair and fiber examinations are performed. It's based upon uh, a theory, and it's called the cards exchange principle. That theory is that, that when two people come into contact or a person comes into contact with an object, trace evidence or hairs and fibers may be exchanged between the two people or the person and the objects. So it's that evidence of exchange of hairs and fibers that's uh, examined in the laboratory. Uh, uh, so uh, hairs, let's say a hair is, uh, or a fiber, let's use fibers, is found on a body uh, that's found in the woods, and the suspect is, uh, let's say it's a carpet-type fiber or several carpet-type fibers, and a, uh, a suspect is developed, and let's say the body was, they think, was transported to the woods in the suspect's car. We would take known samples from the suspect's car and compare them to the fibers on the found on the body in the woods, and if they were this, uh, have, have the same characteristics, then you, you could say that, we certainly couldn't say that the fiber found on the body came from that car to the exclusion of all others, but you could say that it, it, that car could not be excluded as a source uh, of those fibers. So uh, when I first reported to the laboratory, I, I began by doing uh, those types of examinations. Also during that, in my laboratory stay there, uh, I did some, uh, at that time I started to do some forensic dental exams after I went through some training with, at that time it was the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology and uh, forensic dentists there and gave me some additional training in forensic dentistry. And so I started to do some forensic dental examinations after I was trained and qualified. That certainly, uh, didn't start the other exams. None of the examiners can perform examinations before they are trained and qualified in that in their specific area of expertise. That training usually is about a year from when the person reports to the laboratory from when they they begin examining the evidence, and that's what it was for me. Uh, so uh, as I progressed, I uh, at it became apparent now that DNA was. Um, Evolving started being used in 
1989-1990, but we did not have a, a, a means of characterizing DNA from a single hair because there's, there's really two types of DNA, DNA from the nucleus of the cell and DNA from the mitochondria of the cell. And in a single hair found at a crime scene with no tissue on the root, uh, there, we could not characterize nuclear DNA because there just was not enough present. And based on the biology, there, there, in that single hair, there is mitochondrial DNA sufficient to perform a mitochondrial DNA analysis on that hair. But when, in the early 90s, we did not have a means for analyzing uh, mitochondrial DNA from a single hair. And so the laboratory took it upon itself to perform research, and I was involved in that research with mitochondrial DNA research with a number of individuals from the laboratory. And we uh, spent several years uh, at Quantico in the research facility, the laboratory research facility at Quantico, uh, where we developed uh, a, a protocol procedure to characterize uh, mitochondrial DNA from a single hair, and we also apply it to bones and teeth that may uh, be degraded, uh, have been exposed to the environment for a long time, and there's not enough nuclear DNA present. Uh, mitochondrial DNA generally will be present in order to obtain a mitochondrial DNA profile from those individuals. So uh, while I took a break from my casework in the early 90s for several years to perform mitochondrial DNA analysis research. Uh, it came into, uh, we started to use it in casework in approximately 1996 or so. And from there, it, it grew into a unit within the laboratory and still exists today in the FBI laboratory where they perform uh, mitochondrial DNA examinations. And how reliable is that in comparison to the what was the other type called? Nuclear DNA. So Nuclear. They're, they're, both, they're both reliable. Um, the difference between the nuclear DNA analysis and the mitochondrial DNA analysis, every in nuclear DNA, everybody in the world has a different nuclear DNA profile except for identical twins. So uh, through nuclear DNA analysis, uh, uh, forensic analysis, we can say, let's say, blood from a crime scene came from an individual to the exclusion of everyone else in the world. Uh, that is not true with mitochondrial DNA, um, mainly because mitochondrial DNA is maternally inherited. So uh, you would have the same mitochondrial DNA profile as your mother, as uh, your siblings, as long as you had the same mother. Uh, so any of your maternally related uh, uh, individuals in your family would have the same mitochondrial DNA profile as you. So uh, whereas in nuclear DNA, we can say a uh, say blood from a crime scene came from a, a, an individual to the exclusion of all others in the world. In uh, mitochondrial DNA analysis, we cannot say that, but we can include or exclude individuals as being a source of, let's say, hair or bones or teeth based on their mitochondrial DNA profile, but we cannot say with using mitochondrial DNA that that bone or that hair came from a certain individual to the exclusion of all others because of its maternal inheritance qualities. That's pretty fascinating. Talk to me a little bit about, you said you did hair and fibers? Yeah. Talk to us a little bit about fiber, um, because I know that in the case that I talked about with Dan Riley, one of the things that they were able to prove, they had what they called the murder van, where several uh, people had been murdered in this particular vehicle, and they were able to find different fibers on the corpse and, and to be able to determine that this, this corpse had been in that van, in that murder van. So can you talk to us a little bit more about fibers and how that analysis is done. So getting to that, let's use that example. If there were people in a van, let's say that had carpeting in the van and the uh, deceased were thrown into the van and transported and maybe dumped in the woods or someplace, uh, many times the, the carpet fibers from the van would adhere to the victim 
even after they were deposited, let's say, in the woods. And then uh, once the body was found and the, if the evidence was collected and preserved properly, uh, the examiners would look for any fibers on that victim. And then they would take those and compare them to the known fibers from the, let's say, the carpeting of the van. Well, now, certainly, again, you couldn't say that if they had the same characteristics that the fibers on the victim came from that van to the exclusion of all of their vans in the world because let's say it was the carpeting that came with the van. Well, the auto manufacturers are going to make numerous, numerous um, vans with the same carpet. Uh, but you certainly could say that that van could not be excluded as a source of the fibers on the victim. So that, in conjunction, I'm sure, in that case, I don't know the case, but I would, I would think there was other evidence in the case that would have led them, the jury, to decide that, yes, that that victim had been present in their van. Now, certainly if you had, let's say, blood from that victim or those victims in the van, you could do DNA and you could say, yes, that blood in the van came from that victim to the exclusion of all others in the world. But based on yeah. fibers analysis, you could include or exclude that van as being the source of the fibers on the body. So it just is another piece of evidence in, in, a, in a case presented by the prosecutor. So would you call that circumstantial evidence, the fibers? So we, call, we would call it class evidence as opposed to individual evidence in forensics. Class evidence is where you can put the evidence in a specific class, such as you can say that that van, uh, the fibers found on the victim had the same characteristics and the van could not be excluded as a source. So you can put it in the same class, but you couldn't say that it came from that individual van, as opposed to DNA and fingerprint evidence, which where you can say that that DNA profile came from that individual to the exclusion of all others, or that fingerprint came from that individual to the exclusion of all others. That's individual evidence. All right. So you mentioned the word drawers. When we talk about the lab and DNA and fiber analysis and blood analysis, and we think about TV shows and movies, things have gotten kind of out of control and drawers are expecting things from laboratory analysis that really don't exist. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Sure, absolutely. So we, we in the industry, it's called the CSI effect, actually. And uh, we're well aware of that, that uh, the jurors watch CSI. And by watching CSI and all the other shows that involve forensic analysis, they come to some degree of understanding a little bit, tiny bit of the science. But they expect that if they're chosen for a, to be a juror on a case, they expect the evidence to be presented and, uh, and have an expectation as well. That's how they do it at CSI. And generally, that's not the way it is. Like most of, most, uh, of those shows, there is a grain of, of certainly of, of truth running through those shows about how the exams may be performed. But, Generally, the expectation of the, the jurors, uh, the expectation that the jurors have of, of the speed and, and so forth about how the exam is done is nothing like it is in real life. And, and we understand that they expect that. And, uh, we have to be aware of that when we testify to explain to them, you know, certainly so that they can understand. Uh, what's being done. It may be complex science and DNA analysis. You have to explain it to them so that they can understand it at a very basic level so they can apply, use it, that information to help them make their decision, whether it goes e either way in, in the case. So um, making sure that the jury understands how you do things and, and uh, a little bit about the science may allay the fears that, oh, this wasn't done like CNI, so we can't believe it. But after you try to explain to them what's done and how it's done, hopefully they will understand uh, your job a little bit better and why, you know, evidence exams aren't always obtained in six hours and, and, and you know, it takes days, weeks, months sometimes before uh, we obtain a result in a case. So it's a very real um, CSI effect. 
Um, we see it, and also the bad guys watch CSI too, and they may take precautions to prevent, um, you know, spreading evidence. Uh, so it's something that the forensic community is well aware of. So when you're watching a movie or a TV show or reading a book that talks about laboratory analysis, what are some of the things that really make you want to scream out loud? <laughs> well, um, one thing is the speed of which things are done, uh, portrayed on television and sometimes in novels. It, it, many of these techniques take time um, and uh, you know a lot of uh, effort in order to perform the examinations and uh, the speed at which they're done in real life as opposed to the speed at which they're portrayed in, in movies is often uh, far different. Uh, that's that's one thing. And then the other thing I think that uh, is interesting is DNA, I'm sorry, a forensics it, it is a very specialized world. So if you're in the FBI laboratory and you're performing nuclear DNA and DNA analysis, that's all you do every day, all day. You don't even perform mitochondrial DNA analysis. It's very specialized. Same if you're doing fingerprints. That's all you're doing is fingerprint examinations. Whereas on some of these shows, um, the people who are performing exams, they uh, do the fingerprint exam, then they might do a uh, hair exam, then they might do a document exam, and then they get in the Learjet and they fly across the country and they break down the door and arrest the suspect. And that's just not the way it's done. <laughs> Very specialized work, not only in the laboratory, but also in the field. Very good. Very interesting. All right. So are we ready to discuss this case? Oh, I really sure. wanted to, yeah, I really wanted to do an educational overview, but then apply that to a case so that uh, everyone listening can really see how the case flows and, and how the laboratory is involved. So if you could first start out and tell us about what happened, if you can give us an understanding of the crime and, you know, what occurred and the victims and the suspects. Can you set that up for us first before we talk about the evidence that came to the lab? So, sure. So, this is a case involving two victims that occurred back in the mid-90s. Uh, I believe it was 1994. The victims were uh, Joanne and Alex Katrinak. Joanne is the mother of uh, Alex Katrinak, who at, at that, when, when this crime occurred, uh, the baby was about 15 weeks old, or may have been a little older than that, but uh, it was a small baby. So uh, what happened was, apparently in the, in, in uh, December of 94, not too far before Christmas, Joanne and Alex lived at their house in, uh, it's in Catasauqua, Pennsylvania, not outside of Allentown, Pennsylvania, with uh, her husband, Andrew Katrinak. And, uh, um, Andrew's at work, and apparently uh, one day uh, Joanne calls her mother-in-law and says, uh, do you want to go Christmas shopping? I'll bring the baby, and we'll pick you up in a little Christmas shopping. This is what I recall. It's 20 years later. So, And after an hour, two hours, Joanne and Alex never uh, showed up at the mother-in-law's house, so the mother-in-law um, got a little concerned and called uh, the house, and there was no answer. So then she called her son, uh, Andrew, who is the father of the baby, uh, the husband of Joanne. And he was at work, and he said he didn't know where the where Joanne and Alex were. Um, so uh, they got a little concerned, and one thing led to another, and they went to the house, and they were not present. Her Joanne's car was not present, and there were signs of forcible entry into the house. So they started to look for Joanne, obviously called the police, uh, started to look for Joanne and Alex, and they were not found uh, for some time. But during the course of their search for Joanne and Alex, they did find Joanne's car uh, not too far from their house uh, in a parking lot. Um, and Joanne and Alex were not in the car uh, when the vehicle was found. Uh, there were no signs of struggle in the car. Um, but at, now this time, the FBI was called in uh, by the state and uh, local authorities to assist because now it was, you know, a baby and a mom are missing. It's a possible kidnapping case. Uh, 
So the Bureau is working in conjunction with this, the local officials and the Pennsylvania State Police throughout this case. So uh, it's, a, it's a joint effort, a law enforcement effort. And when they, the uh, Pennsylvania State Police processed the car, uh, they, they recovered several head hairs on the driver's side headrest of Joanne Katrinak's vehicle. And when they sent those into the laboratory and we looked at them, we noticed that there was blood on the hairs. There was no other blood anywhere in the car, so that's a little bit unusual. And they also noticed, I believe, if I remember correctly, that the driver's side uh, car seat was pulled very for far forward. And so Joanne was, uh, I understand, was fairly tall and uh, would have driven the car um, with the seat pushed further back. And so months go by until months later in the spring, I believe it was, of uh, 1995 it would have been, a uh, farmer is out in the field and discovers the body of Joanne and, and Alex, the baby, uh, Joanne had been shot um, and kind of beaten and shot with a uh, 22 caliber, they believe, handgun. And the baby, as far as I remember, uh, cause of death was uh, unknown, but they believe that the baby was just left out there in the cold of winter to die. So a terrible, terrible crime. Uh, we have two dead bodies. We have the three hairs, or three or I don't remember exactly, it was several hairs found on the headrest. So they were long, sort of blonde hairs. And so uh, now we could compare those hairs on the headrest to Joanne's because you would expect if she were driving the car, we would find her hairs on the headrest. But when now when we found her body, we had a known sample from her. And Joanne's hairs didn't look under the microscope anything like the hairs on the headrest. So the Pennsylvania State Police and the Bureau and local officials started to go back through their suspects and they identified a suspect with longer blondish hair and it was a woman by the name of Patricia Rohrer. Uh, she was living down at North, in North Carolina during the time of the disappearance. Uh, she was the ex-girlfriend of uh, Joanne's husband, Andrew Katrinak. Uh, apparently, um, not long before she went missing, she had called the Katrinak residence and Joanne picked up the phone and Patricia Rohr wanted to talk to Andrew and uh, Joanne didn't uh, care for that and hung up on Patricia Rohr. Um, Can I ask you a question? Sure. When you say the, the former girlfriend, mm -hmm. uh, was that during the marriage or before no, the marriage? I believe it was before, before the marriage, yes, okay. I believe. So when apparently uh, she called, she hung up, um, uh, Joanne hung up on her, and several weeks, months, I'm not sure exactly, but not long after uh, Joanne and Alex go missing. Uh, they also asked Patricia Rohrer, and again, we in the laboratory, we don't, you know, we kind of stay in our swim lane and, and do our forensic work. So we uh, we get enough information from the investigators to do our forensic work, but we, we don't want to be biased in any manner by too much information about what might have happened because, you know, we like to think the science doesn't lie. And uh, we'll do our exam and we'll testify for the prosecution. And most of us who have done it long enough also have testified for the defense uh, because we just want to testify to what the evidence shows. So uh, we now... Patricia Rohr becomes a suspect in the case. She apparently w said she was not in Pennsylvania at the time of the murders, and through investigation they found either receipts, I don't recall exactly what, that put her in Pennsylvania about the time of the murders. So now we get a known head hair sample from Patricia Rohr, and she had dyed her hair but the uh, since the time of the murder, but about a quarter of an inch of the hair that... Um, was not dyed um, down near the root, did look like in the microscope the hair is found on the seat back. So now we perform, the, now the interesting part of this case is the crime occurred in 1994 uh, and didn't go to trial until 1998. And part of that delay was because the the prosecutor's office uh, in, in Catasauqua, Pennsylvania, 
had somehow uh, learned that we were performing uh, research on mitochondrial DNA analysis in the FBI laboratory. And he waited to prosecute this case until we were up and running with our analysis. So he, he waited until we were ready to go. And once we were ready to go and we were online with it, we had done all our validation studies and had our standard operating procedures. He then submitted the evidence to the laboratory for us to perform mitochondrial DNA analysis on the hair. And when we did that, we had a known sample from Patricia Rohr and an, uh, the mitochondrial DNA from the hairs on the seat back and the mitochondrial DNA sequence from the hairs matched the mitochondrial DNA sequence from Patricia Rohr. So again, you can't say that those hairs on the seat back came from Patricia Rohr to the exclusion of everybody else in the world. However, you cannot eliminate those hairs on the seat back as having come from Patricia Rohr. So that's what I testified to in the case. Um, there was other evidence pre presented, and I'm not exactly aware of much of the evidence that was presented, but I know that um, I, I do remember that they they could put her in Pennsylvania around the time of the murders, and there may have been some other evidence. They never did recover the murder weapon, as far as I know. Uh, but based on the the all the evidence in the case, Patricia Rohr was then convicted of the kidnapping and murder of Joanne and Alex Katrinak. And part of that evidence was the mitochondrial DNA analysis that we performed on the hairs from the seat back of the car. Also, uh, going back to the car seat, Patricia Rohr is, is fairly uh, short in stature. And uh, again, Joanne was fairly uh, tall. So the scenario uh, that the prosecutor presented was that uh, she uh, drove up from North Carolina, kidnapped Joanne and the baby, took them out, killed them, and then in, in Joanne's car. And then uh, from that interaction, some of the uh, blood um, got on her hair, on Patricia Orr's hair. She got back in uh, Joanne's car, pulled the seat forward because she's short, and she drove the car back to that parking lot. And it, when she, uh, uh, during that drive, some of her hairs came off and were deposited on the seat back with the blood of Joanne on the hairs. And then she gets back in her vehicle or somehow gets back to North Carolina. That was the theory of the prosecution in, in the case. That's pretty fascinating. I, I would assume that one of the things that the jurors would have liked to have seen or the prosecutor would have liked to have seen is also fingerprints, uh, Patricia Rohr's fingerprints in Joanne's car. But it doesn't sound like you had that combination. It was the hairs. Um, right. As far as I know of, there were no fingerprints in the car, as far as I know, that of Patricia, uh, Patricia Rohr's. Now, what was interesting to me is when you had suggested that uh, this would be the case, and I could see why, because this is one of the first cases where you were able to use your your new research about uh, mitochondrial DNA, uh, which is absolutely fascinating, that you were able to explain it and that the jurors were able to receive it to the point that, you know, they were able to to use it in, in their decision to to convict or to acquit. Um, but one of the things that was interesting to me is that when you talked about the case and I looked it up, I informed you that when I looked it up that just this year there was a reexamination of the evidence in that case. How did you feel when when you learned about that? I'm surprised that no one reached out to you and told you about it. So, um, yeah, and it's not unusual that evidence is reexamined. And uh, my philosophy has always been, uh, you know, we did our protocols, we did our, we did uh, follow the photo protocols, uh, the, the technique was valid. And if somebody wants to reexamine it, you know, have at it. That's kind of the way I feel. And certainly, obviously, if, if, um, there was any sort of issue with uh, the examinations I would I did I would certainly want to know about it before anybody else. So my my theory and most of the people that do 
do these exams are, you know, if you want to re-examine, go right ahead. Um, we have nothing to hide here, um, and we want to get to the truth, no matter where that, that leads. Well, I'm going to put links to the articles that I found, but let me be clear that the re-examination, of course, is by the defense, who, of mm -hmm. course, is always trying to say, you know, I, you got the wrong person, it wasn't me, but also that no one is disputing that it was Patricia Rohr's hair. What mm -hmm. they're disputing is that there was another hair oh. and that no one ever determined whose hair that was. Okay. Um, uh, uh, so, you know, I, I, I don't think anybody is saying that your examination was, was, uh, was false, but, mm -hmm. you know, they're trying to bring in the possibility that there was somebody else either there or that uh, somebody else did it. So it's really fascinating. It you know, really is fascinating. And I guess this is one of those CSI effects things that people can poke holes in, in this uh, type of analysis because of those TV shows. And I, I know many people who listen to FBI Retired Case Style Review are armchair investigators themselves. So, you know, it's, it's really fascinating for all of us to, to kind of look at cases and, you know, re-examine some of the things that were done. So I, I guess, like you said, that it just comes with the territory. It, it does. And, and again, um, you know, we, it, the science, we feel if, if the examination is done properly, uh, the science doesn't lie. Certainly, the science has limitations, such as in this case, mitochondrial DNA. We can, we cannot exclude somebody as a source, but we can't say it came from that person to the exclusion of all others. Um, but we also like to think that we try to do the right thing, and wherever that leads us, whether it be uh, the results assist the the prosecutor or the defense attorney, that's you know that's. Science, and we will certainly testify to our results on behalf of either side, depending on the results of the evidence and, and who wants it presented. Well, we, we have to all agree that the introduction of DNA analysis um, has been the most positive thing when it comes to evidence and prosecutions. There have been numerous death penalty cases where the uh, the suspect uh, has now been exonerated uh, because of DNA analysis. I know that must be something that you're very excited about and very proud about because when they were initially convicted, there, there wasn't that possibility of, of doing that type of examination. Can you talk to me about that? Sure. So it's, uh, yes, it's uh, DNA has, again, it... Um, um, it has really been a terrific tool for law enforcement, and uh, many of the cases that have been overturned simply because the, that technique analysis of analysis wasn't available at the time of the conviction. And, and now that we have it available, the evidence is reexamined, and um, sometimes it uh, contradicts the theory of what happened in the case. And you know, the, it, it uh, justice is is served. Before you retired, you became the head of the of the FBI lab. Could you tell me more about that type of responsibility and that position? What were uh, what were your duties? So yes, yeah, so for a few years before I retired, I was the director of the FBI laboratory, where I had about 800 or 900 people working in the laboratory um, and doing the things that we've talked about, uh, mostly forensic analysis or response. So it was an honor. Um, for me to uh, to do that uh, job, um, it was uh, it was uh, very very rewarding. Sometimes um, difficult in the uh, because the, there were personnel resource issues and and budget resource issues that not only the FBI laboratory but every division when the F in, within the FBI faces where we always want more people and more money to be able to do our work. Uh, but uh, it, the people that work for the FBI in general and certainly in the laboratory, in, in my opinion, are, are terrific folks uh, trying to do the right thing. And it was a pleasure and an honor 
to be able to try to lead those folks and, and help them. I always viewed my job was to try to help them do their their work uh, better, faster, cheaper if we could. So um, it was it was a terrific experience, a job that certainly is is rewarding and and also uh, could be could have, could be very stressful at times, but very rewarding in the end. So Joe, could you tell us what you're doing now? Yeah, I'm teaching forensic science at George Mason University. I also work for a government contractor, but um, uh, teach uh, forensic science at George Mason University in uh, Fairfax, Virginia. And we have a, uh, an undergraduate and graduate level program where I, I not only teach them the basics of forensic science, but uh, not only I, but there are several, uh, mo- uh, actually all the faculty here in the forensic science program have had real world experience in the forensic world. So we not only can tell them uh, the theory about how things are done, but show them in casework that we've actually done as to how the theory and the analysis can be applied to uh, trying to solve a forensic case. So that again is, is it's very rewarding working with the students. They're very bright, very energetic. And it, it's uh, it's a terrific uh, experience for me and an honor for me to be able to do that. I always like to give my guests the last word. What would you like to say? DNA certainly works to include or exclude a suspect in the case. And many times the exclusion, even for law enforcement in the investigative phase, the exclusion of a suspect is as important or more important than the inclusion of that suspect, just so that we... Um, it can help in trying the uh, in helping the, the investigators focus on a specific individual or turn their attention to somebody else. Um, so, it, yes, it has been a great tool for law enforcement, and it it, it, um, it can assist in the prosecution. It also can assist in in the defense, and that's uh, in my opinion, that's exactly what it should do. And that's the end of the interview. As always, back at jerrywilliams.com, you'll find a photo of Dr. Joe DeSino. I have several links to newspaper articles about the case, plus links to the FBI webpage that tells you all about the FBI laboratory. There's also a Nat Geo special done two years ago called Inside the FBI Crime Laboratory. So if you want to learn even more about the lab in this case, please go to jerrywilliams.com and check out this episode's show notes. I hope you enjoyed the interview. And if you did, I hope you share it with your friends, family, and associates. If you're listening to this by way of a podcast app, you can share the episode directly from your device. And if you're listening to this on my website, All the social media share buttons are at the bottom of the show notes. I don't have a crime fiction recommendation for you, but if you're looking for something good to read, I hope you'll check out my FBI crime thriller, Pay to Play, about a female FBI agent investigating corruption in the Philadelphia strip club industry. The book is available as an ebook, trade paperback, and audiobook. And I want to remind you, I still have a few promo codes, which are good for a free copy of the pay to play audiobook. They're first come first serve. So if you're thinking that this sounds like a book that you might like, then just email me, let me know, and I'll send you out that promo code so you can get a free copy of pay to play. All I would ask is if you do enjoy listening to the crime thriller that you leave a review at audible.com. This episode was sponsored by fbiretired.com, the only online directory made available to the general public featuring retired FBI agents and analysts interested in showcasing their skills to secure business opportunities. I want to thank you for listening, and I hope you come back again for another episode of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. Thank you.